Its peak stands 8,611 meters high. To scale it is the dream of every mountaineer, the dream of Hans Kammerlander, the climber from South Tyrol. I have actually tried to climb K2 twice. The first time bureaucracy stopped me. I climbed Broad Peak, the neighboring mountain, with a fellow climber, also from South Tyrol. And then I wanted to go and join a German expedition to climb K2. But the bureaucrat stopped me at the last minute. It was not possible to climb two 8,000 meter peaks with the two different expeditions in the same year, they said. So I went back home totally disappointed. I think it would have been the perfect weather too. And then a few years later, it was last year, I wanted to climb Kachinchunga, the third highest mountain in the world, which I did too. Afterwards I wanted to climb Manoslu, and then after this ideal preparation to go for K2. But unfortunately I injured my feet on Kachinchunga. Second attempt, May 14th, 1998. At the border between India and Nepal, Hans Kammerlander and his friend Konrad Auer climb Kachanyunga, the third highest mountain on this planet. It is the beginning of a peerless trilogy. Kammerlander wants to have climbed his last three 8,000-meter peaks by the beginning of August. Then he would become a member of this exclusive club of mountaineers who have climbed all 14 8,000-meter summits on Earth. After two nights on the mountain, the South Tyrolean climbers reached the summit in the afternoon of May 17th. 8,586 meters above sea level, an unusual manifestation of joy on the roof of the world. While Auer descends on foot, Kammerlander uses custom-made skis, an unusual and dangerous undertaking. One wrong move can cause a deadly fall. On skis, though, Kammerlander is faster to leave the death zone above 7,000 meters, where oxygen is scarce. Six hours later, Hans Kammerlander is back to base camp. His friend, Walter Lücke, greets him. Hans seems to have stood the adventure well, but the joy is premature. The icy nights in the camps and a pinching ski boot during the downhill run have left their marks on him. His right foot aches. You're looking good. My foot hurts. He has his foot examined by an American physician in Kathmandu. The diagnosis is depressing. The big toe is apparently frostbitten. In the future, they will be more likely to get very cold easily anyway. Um, so, the, as you know, what we, I think you probably know, what we do basically is we wait. We wait. We wait, yeah. <clears throat> I cannot go again to Pakistan for K2 in on two weeks. No chance. This, you know, these, maybe, this, maybe, this. No one. chance. This one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is <laughs> This is the end of Kammerlander's dreams. For the time being, K2 has receded into a dim distance, yet he doesn't give up. In the summer, he wants to finally conquer the mountain of mountains. It is June 16, 1999. Jeeps bring the expedition to Ascoli, a small mountain village at an altitude of 3,000 meters. From here on, they will continue the ascent on foot onto the central massive of the Karakoran Range, onto K2. Initially, Konrad Auer takes the lead of the group up to base camp. Hans Kammerlander will join them later. At the moment, he is preparing for K2 in China. Hans is on Mustagata with an expedition group from his Alpine school. Mustagata is a skiing mountain, 7,500 meters high. I think this is good for acclimatization. He will arrive here in excellent condition. When is he arriving? At the end of June. On the following morning, the equipment is divided among the porters. They are Balti, one of many mountain peoples in the Karakoram range. Tents, food supplies, mats, ice axes, and a lot more must be carried uphill on foot. An arduous job. A man responsible for the porters strictly watches over the observance of the maximum load, 25 kilograms on each back. 
Twice a day, they must stop to pray. The strict rites of the Quran, according to which the faithful must pray toward Mecca five times a day, are overridden here due to the long marches every day. The porter's union has done a good job. Now they get shoes, warm clothing, food, and about $8 per day. 62 years ago, I was 10 back then, we carried the equipment of the first British expeditions to K2, each one of us with up to 70 kilos load. No one asked us if it was too heavy. Shoes? You could hardly call them that. Often we had to walk barefooted because the soles had worn through. At 7 in the morning of June 17th, 312 porters leave Ascoli. A total of five expeditions want to climb K2, or one of the other three 8,000-meter peaks in the Karakoram Range. The temperature is 25 degrees Celsius already. The snow melt has only just started. Water from higher altitudes is flowing into the torrential basin of the awesome Baltoro Glacier. A toll has to be paid to cross a bridge, a profitable business for the owner, with the number of expeditions growing every year. Like Conrad Auer, Walter Lücke is also part of the Kammerlander team again. The journalist will be responsible for radio communication from base camp. After a couple of hours of hiking, the sun shines mercilessly upon them. It's unbelievable. 36 degrees at half past eight. The natives quench their thirst with glacial water. The brown water is poison to the Europeans, though, acute danger of diarrhea. It's important to take your time when you hike uphill, and also not to drink any glacial water, even when it is hot up there sometimes. You should be careful not to upset your bowels, but the most important thing is to take your time, to do everything slowly. You see the mountains in front of you, and you'd like to go straight up, but you should take your time. For the porters, the hike to base camp is routine. During the summer, when the foreigners come, they go up the arduous way up to five times per season. The job may be paid well by Pakistani standards, but it also affects the health of these men. There's a fierce weapon, and here all bodies were burned, and uh, walks, then here very height, this way, and then very shoes here, very pain. The Paju camp, a small oasis at an altitude of 3,500 meters. In order to acclimate to the altitude, expeditions take a rest here for one day. It is a welcome opportunity for the porters to have themselves checked by the doctor. A busy day for physician Manuel Luli, leader of one of the international expeditions. One of the porters has a bad tooth. Manuel Luli can only watch him for now. The infected tooth should be extracted at once, but the doctor does not have the appropriate equipment with him. We can do actually very, very little here, but uh, to clean the, the wounds, um, give some antibiotics in case like this one, because he has a very, very bad uh, dental infection, and I give him just three antibiotics to take out all the, the rest of the infection. I think we will have to do again tomorrow because it's very... Yes. Could you... And other things are maybe blisters, but it's very common. A goat is slaughtered, the first piece of meat for porters and expedition members for days. Here in Paju, they also replenish their supplies for the next stage. No firewood can be found in the barren rocky desert of the Baltoro Glacier that extends all the way up to base camp. So the porters are busy backing chapati, a flat bread made of wheat flour. A big Balti celebration is planned for tonight, and a cow was slaughtered for the occasion. The meat is cut into small chunks and evenly divided into 153 portions. The expedition members must content themselves with the goat's liver. No meat tonight. No thanks, I couldn't eat someone I had walked with on the mountains.
high spirits on the eve of the most demanding stage, the crossing of the Baltoro Glacier. Mountaineers and porters celebrate together. The celebration is over early. They all know that a 12-hour hike awaits them in the morning. First, they follow a path along the glacier's meltwater stream. After an hour, the glacier opens like an enormous mouth. A thick brown liquid pours out from the inside of the glacier. Up on the ridge, the caravan of porters progresses slowly on the scree. Now begins the most trying stage of the march to K2. The temperature is falling. The Baltoro Glacier winds its way through the mountains of the Karakoram, a desert of ice, snow, and scree. Fog gathers. The eternal ice transforms the landscape. The expedition has almost reached an altitude of 4,500 meters. Some men complain about headaches and chest pains, the consequence of the high altitude. Suddenly, the landscape changes again. The narrow glacier valley opens up to a spacious plateau, which French mountaineers named Place de la Concorde. The caravan continues. The porters know now that the end is near. After six days of hiking, K2 becomes visible for the first time. On June 23rd, Konrad Auer and Walter Lücke reached the base camp at 5,100 meters, together with the international expedition led by Manuel Lully, the Italian doctor. Well, finally arrived. Yes, we're home. The porters are also happy to have reached the base camp. All they want now is to get paid and start their descent as soon as possible. Konrad Auer gives every one of them a few extra rupees as a tip. Thank you. Thank you. The Balti porters leave on the same day. They don't have enough warm clothing with them for a night in the icy base camp. Base camp is situated on the moraine of the Godwin Austin Glacier. The tents seem like children's toys in the awesome landscape. After one week at base camp, Hans Kamerlander joins the expedition. He has stood the preparations in China well, but also had a chance to try out his skis on Mustagata. First impressions at the mountain of mountains. What impresses me most about K2 is that although the weather is nice and all the other peaks around it are sunny and clear, K2 is always covered in clouds from midday onwards, if not earlier. It is stormy and turbulent up there. But down here at base camp, you have the feeling it's the most beautiful weather. This is the most dangerous thing about K2, the severe storms and the fact that it is a very demanding mountain technically. You just can't go up wrapped up in warm clothes and thick gloves, like you do with other 8,000 meter mountains. You have to use light equipment so that you are light-handed enough to master the difficulties of climbing. First of all, though, the material has to be inspected. Kamerlander has had special ski sticks made for the downhill run. The ski sticks have been modified a little. They have a novel type of grips. This should be an emergency brake in case of a fall during the downhill run. The temperature at 8,000 meters altitude can be as cold as 45 degrees below zero. A face mask prevents the climbers from frostbites. Ski goggles can also be helpful, but Konrad Auer has forgotten his. Got your ski goggles? No. The good thing is that the injured toe from last year does not bother him anymore. How is your foot now? Well, it's healed all right. 
When I returned from Kachin Yunga last year with my foot black and frostbitten, I would never have thought that a year later I would be at the foot of K2 thinking of climbing it. At the same time, however, another expedition is underway on K2. On the southwest flank, the so-called Abruzzi Ridge, six climbers ascend slowly. They are the members of the international expedition led by Manuel Luli. They set up Camp 1 at 6,100 meters altitude. One of them is Michael Siriano, a mountaineer from Romania. On the following day, the advance troop returns to base camp. Hi. How are you? Bene? Good sleep tonight? No. <laughs> not, not, no sleep? Very bad sleep. Headache? Uh, no, you know. Room, room, room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sleeping. All the way, turn around and... from one side oh, to the other. Headaches and chest pains are some of the problems one has to face at this altitude. K2 inspires everyone with enormous respect and awe. But Jay Seeger, an American climber, is well aware of its dangers. Yeah, I know. That's the problem, because we go up that snow there, and if it gets any snow, man, that's going to be avalanche. And then you got to go on the rocks, and there's... Yeah. K2 is unpredictable. Apart from the imminent danger of avalanches, Altitude sickness due to the thinning air is also a constant worry for climbers. Conrad Auer is examined in the tent of a Swiss doctor's expedition. The concentration of oxygen in his blood is found to be 84% at this altitude. What you see here is the saturation, which is the percentage of oxygen in the blood. This here is your pulse. It fluctuates a bit, which is absolutely normal. For this altitude, saturation is very good. No problem at all. What is normal? On sea level, normal concentration is between 95 and 100 percent with smokers a little worse off than non-smokers. But especially in rescue medicine, someone with a concentration of under 90% would be given oxygen and examined to find out where the problem lies. But up here, our people had between 75 and 80%. If someone is seriously ill, and as we are at an altitude that cannot be easily lost due to the long hiking distance, we sometimes have to assist with oxygen. There is the option of a decompression bag, where you can put in a patient and basically decompress him to an altitude of 2,000 meters. But this is, of course, only a temporary solution, as is medication. When symptoms such as nausea, apathy or headache appear, the death of a patient can be only hours away. The decompression bag into which the body is placed, simulates a lower altitude with accordingly higher pressure, thus supplying the blood cells with adequate oxygen again. A barometer measures the fictitious altitude in the bag. The higher the altitude where a climber gets sick, the less time remains to save him. Uh, it's not, in this case, it's not so easy because if you develop um, high altitude sickness at this altitude, it's very high, 7,000 meters, it's supposed that it, it, uh, it takes to you at least uh, in a mountain like A2, two days to bring him down. So the symptoms have time to develop and increase and be very, very bad. So I think the higher is the altitude and the, the, the longer is the time you take to take the, the victim down, the longer you have to keep him uh, in gamma bag and uh, giving him uh, aid and, and medicine and treatment, you know. Most people who have lost their lives in Karakoram and the Himalayas are victims of altitude sickness. For all those, a memorial has been erected at the foot of K2. Pictures and tin plates with the names of the deceased remind of the dark side of the mountain.
Of course, I feel sorry for the surviving dependents. There have been a lot of fatal accidents on K2. However, these memorial plates should not give rise to negative thinking, because then you are definitely at the wrong place. I wouldn't say that I feel more frightened or respectful of the mountain when I think of it. I will just go up there for as long as I have the feeling that I have got things under control. But if I see that it is getting too difficult or too dangerous, I will immediately turn back. Spirits are high at base camp. The weather has been good for a whole week. The expeditions are ready for the first ascent. There is a storm going on on Broad Peak, the neighboring 8,000 meter mountain. But at the foot of K2, the weather is calm. It's time for lunch. On the day before the big ascent, the little field kitchen produces an Italian specialty. Hartman Ziba, the cameraman, and Mohammed, the cook, are making some pasta al arabiata. Walter Lücke, Konrad Auer, and Hans Kammerlander are delighted by this variation in the menu. At this altitude, carbohydrates are enormously important for physical fitness, especially when climbing K2 is on the plans for the following day. <laughs> In the evening before the ascent, K2 shows its dangerous side. An enormous avalanche from almost 8,000 meters high roars down the south flank. The respect is growing. What troubles me most about K2 is when we climb up to 7,300 meters where this snow plateau is. When we get past that and walk into a snowstorm, then it will be extremely problematic to find our way back because at the end of the snow field you have to find a very complicated entry in a precipice otherwise you are stuck there and can't possibly get back down if you don't find this entry july 9th base camp the attempt to conquer k2 is about to start how are things today oh, the weather is perfect with weather like this for three or four days we could do the job at 3.30 p.m., the South Tyrolean mountaineers start their ascent over the moraine of the Godwin-Austin Glacier to an icefall in two hours. Behind it begins the Abruzzi Ridge, the route followed by the first climbers to ascend K2. The plan is to go up to about 7,000 meters in two days. Using light equipment, the two men want to go up as quickly as possible. At the moment, the icy giant shows its sunny side. I think Hans is in very good condition. I've had the feeling all day that he has an unbelievable drive, that the mountain attracts him like a magnet. But I have to say that it's quite unusual for two climbers like Hans and Conrad to start a mountain expedition in the afternoon. But it has been so great today, and it was as if the sun was smiling down on us. Well, I think we are really going to achieve something. Ja, ich denke einfach, irgendwas, irgendwas passiert. The ice fall. A bizarrely beautiful landscape, though dangerous at the same time. Glacier cracks lure everywhere, often covered only by a layer of soft snow. For now, everything goes according to plan. The good weather is still holding. In order to preserve their energy, the two climbers walk up very slowly. Hans Kammerlander has the custom-made skis with him. He wants to carry them all the way up to the peak. At 5,300 meters above the ice fall, a hurricane approaches, blowing snow onto the southwest flank. The weather conditions deteriorate. Now, the altitude becomes increasingly noticeable too. They march 10 steps, rest for a little while, then march again. The snow is getting higher, following the track is becoming more and more tiring. A lot of fresh snow.
One of K2's key sections is the so-called house chimney, where fresh snow is lying on smooth ice. The two mountaineers climb up the vertical precipice without safety hooks or ropes, a risky undertaking. After managing this obstacle, they set up Camp 1 at an altitude of 6,100 meters. It is the worst thing that can happen when you have to set up the camp during a snowstorm. The spot here is unbelievably bad, full of steep ice flanks. We have to hack it all free with our ice picks. The appalling weather conditions on K2 make prospects for the following day gloomy. Still, the two mountaineers are prepared to wait. The night in the icy tent passes without sleep. Condensation freezes on the tent walls and forms snowflakes that fall on the sleeping bags. Nevertheless, Hans and Konrad are optimistic. Such adversities are common on K2. Two more climbers decide to start their ascent from base camp on the following day. It is Jay Seeger, the American, and Michael Sirianu, the Romanian. They want to follow the two South Tyrolians' tracks. Particularly Michael wants to reach the summit at any cost. Climbing 8,000 meter peaks is my heart's desire. I just feel good when I sense the dangers of it. Why do I want to climb K2? Because it is the mountain of mountains for me. I know the three most beautiful mountains in the world. K2, of course, then Nangapabat and Lhotse. The last two I have already climbed and stood on their summits. Michael worked as an electrician in Germany for six months in order to gather the money necessary for the fulfillment of his life's dream. Jay and Michael start ascending at four in the morning, although their adaptation to the high altitude is not completed yet. Me and Michelino were, we were pretty excited about that day. It was crystal clear blue, beautiful sunset. The barometer was reading real high, and we were really thinking that we were going to get our shot at the summit. After almost four hours of climbing, Michael wants to take a break. He takes off his backpack and turns his back to the mountain. Suddenly, a loose rock becomes detached above him and hits him below the left shoulder as it falls. Michael is in agony. The accident scene is in a rocky area. He was screaming in pain, so I said, OK, well, we're going to have to go down, Michalino. And then he tried, and he said, no, I can't, I can't. I said, Michalino, you're going to have to go down. And he said, no, I can't, I can't. I said, well, OK, then I'll go down and get some help. He said, no, no, you got to stay here with me. So I said, oh, well, well where's your radio? Then uh, finally somebody answered the radio, thank God. Uh, Oscar answered, and then he handed it over to Manuel because he speaks better English. And I told him the situation. I said, OK, Michalino got hit by a rock. He's in a lot of pain. Uh, is there something you want me to do? Because uh, I don't really think I should be doing something without medical orders. And he said, no, no, just stay there, make him comfortable, and we'll come up and get him. Everyone is in a hectic state at base camp. Manuel Luli wants to go up to Michael as quickly as possible. Mikhail was hit by a rock. Coming down, maybe the sun is melting the snow, of course, a very hot sun, and uh, he was hit on the... Left shoulder, we don't know what is the real situation because we are still here and uh, I think he, can, uh, the, he can't move the, the arm. So they are just two of them and they need to uh, help to come down. I will bring some uh, painkillers, strong painkillers to help him to, to come down without too much pain. On which altitude is it? 5,300. It's very difficult to rescue him? Oh, 5,300 is, I think it's just uh, snow, so I hope it will not be so, but anyway, there are no ropes in that section, so it's not so easy. It's not so easy. It will be four of us to help him. 
At that time, base camp think that Michael has just broken his shoulder. The rescue team is optimistic. The scene of the accident is not very high up the mountain, and the track not too arduous. Oscar Piazza, Ur Urochak, and Manuel Luli quickly pack just the essentials in order to reach Michael and bring him back down as soon as possible. Okay, uh, which is the situation? We are starting now with all the things we need to rescue. Uh, how is Mihai? Over. Yeah, Mihai is in a lot of pain. He's got uh, some kind of a chest injury. He says he's having trouble breathing. He can breathe, but not very good. So if you can breathe something for that, that effect, uh, he's in enough pain where he's talking about a helicopter. Okay, uh, we are coming, we are coming, uh, I have a strong painkiller, I think it will be good to bring him down, uh, then we will uh, uh, try to uh, organize uh, a rescue, but I, I need to see him, uh, and is there uh, any external uh, sign of, of, uh, of the heat of the rock? Over. Uh, just a scab, it looks like uh, it stopped bleeding. There's no external bleeding right now. Uh, he's definitely in a lot of pain. Uh, okay, Jay, uh, you are at 5,300, you said, right? Negative. you got a lot of work to do. We're just below one. About uh, 5,700, 5,800 meters. Okay, 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 okay. I understand. Put him warm. Yeah, uh, keep keep uh, Mihai warm. Cover him with uh, jackets or everything you have. And uh, uh, we are coming. Over. It is 10 o'clock by now. The rescue team begins their climb. Hans Kammerlander and Konrad Auer are at an altitude of 7,000 meters. Radio contact with them, however, can only be established an hour later. Too late to ask them for help. No, we didn't hear anything about it. Otherwise, we could have helped. At which altitude is he approximately? 5,700. A bit below Camp 1. Have they tried to call for a helicopter? At the moment, we are waiting for Manuel, the doctor, to go up and make a diagnosis. Walter Lücke is keeping contact with the accident scene from base camp, but the news from there is getting worse and worse. I try to reach Manuel. Wait a moment, please. He was still very uncomfortable. You can see he had trouble breathing. Every once in a while, he would go up like this and try to get a gasp of breath, and he had a lot of saliva in his mouth, but never any blood. So I figured, okay, well, we'll just keep him comfortable and wait till somebody comes, and try to talk to him, calm him down, relax him, tell him he's tough, tell him about his little daughter at home. And it seemed like everything was going to be okay. And uh, I kept contact on the radio. Jay, it's impossible now to reach Manuel. Wait for a few minutes. I'll be right back to you. Coming. I'm afraid we've lost Nicolino. No! No! Jay, repeat, please. Jay, give me two minutes, please. Jay, I please you, try a reanimation, please, try it. Okay, Jay, try everything you can do. I try to reach manual, please. Understanding? I am. I'm doing everything I can. I call you back in two or three minutes. Wait, please. 
Gott, was machen wir denn jetzt? My God, what are we going to do? Michelino ist tot. Michelino ist tot. When I saw him die and when I just saw him just lying there, that was a very heavy experience for me because I never, no one ever died in my arms like that before. Especially no one so unexpectedly mm. died. You know, somebody who was so healthy just a few hours before, 31 years old. Thirty minutes later, Manuel and the rest of the team arrive. Hardly, but in the end, uh, uh, I think he he didn't was aware of nothing. He didn't was. K2, 7,400 meters. Hans Kammerlander and Konrad Auer are turning back. After Michael's death, their motivation to continue climbing has vanished for today. Then came even the news that. And then we heard the news that he didn't recover from his injury. During moments like this, you lose it completely. You naturally ask yourself, what are you doing here? But then, of course, you have to think about it realistically and with a clear head. Such is life. We know it's a fact that whoever climbs a mountain moves in a very dangerous zone. That's the plain truth. Many people who aren't climbers would ask now, how can you carry on climbing this mountain immediately after someone has died? Someone we all knew. Everyone who knows about the obsession of mountaineering would not ask such a question. And the rest, they cannot understand it anyway. The mountain cloaks its countenance. And spirits are low in the base camp after the tragedy with the Romanian climber. There are no signs of euphoria anymore. On July 11, 1999, a stone grave is dug at the foot of K2. It shall be Michael's last resting place. His friends carry him to the grave over the talus of the Godwin-Austin Glacier. Michael's face is covered with a cloth. Final preparations for the funeral ceremony are made. Manuel, Angelo, Oscar, and Ur carry Michael's remains to the grave. He will be registered in the statistics as the 46th casualty on K2. Michael leaves behind his wife and two children. He had promised them that K2 would be his last 8,000-meter summit. News of his death reaches the family in Romania four days after the accident. For most members of Michael's expedition, the quest to reach the peak of K2 is over now. They just want to go home. Furthermore, it is now July, and in the Karakoram range, the summer is drawing to an end. Only Jay, of all people, in whose arms Michael died, still has the motivation to reach the summit. My commitment is to climb K2, and I will climb it in the memory and honor of my friend Michalino, because Michalino was very motivated, and that's why he became my climbing partner on this particular run and a, a run before because he was always ready to go and uh, I'm particularly motivated on this trip myself and I'm sure his soul wants me to keep going and I, my commitment is to climb K2 and take his soul up there with me. As with all people who have died on K2, Michael's companions carve his name, his year of birth, and his year of death onto a tin plate. Everyone is deeply moved. They had actually planned to climb Broad Peak, the less demanding neighboring mountain in the Karakoram Range. But Michael had persisted in his dream to climb K2 and paid for it with his life. 
The carved plate is not put up on the memorial at the foot of K2 as usual, but directly on Michael's grave, on the way to the Abruzzi Ridge. July the 12th, 1999, the weather has further deteriorated. A snowstorm rages overnight. K2 is shrouded in clouds. The mood in the base camp is analogous to the weather conditions. No one is inspired by K2 any longer. For Hans Kammerlander, time is running out. The adverse weather conditions interfere with his plans. He sees little chance to climb K2 before the end of the summer. It's pretty clear now. A couple of days ago our chances were very good, but I think if it continues to snow throughout the day our chances to reach the summit will diminish to about 10%, which is clearly not favorable. Because of the fresh snow the mountain has become much more dangerous and the threat of avalanches has increased. The Black Pyramid, for example, a feared wall of smooth rock several hundreds of meters high, will now be very, very dangerous with the fresh snow settled on it. We must be really careful there. In any case, we'll try to go up if the weather improves. But if the risks are incalculable, we'll just leave it and come back next year. There is an air of idleness in the base camp. Did you sleep, Connie? Same weather again today. Not that much we can do. I'm getting back to bed. This inactivity, however, does not last long. The clouds around the peak of K2 disperse in the evening. Hope returns. At night, around a kerosene light, the members of the expedition discuss their ascent for the following day. They can only guess how the weather conditions are going to be in the Abruzzi Ridge, but they are determined to give it one last try. The point is that, especially on a mountain, it is hard to foresee these things. You just have to go and try it, and if it doesn't work, you turn back. It shouldn't be a problem. But we need good weather for three days if we are to have a realistic chance to make it through. And even then we still have to clear our own way. They confer about the route they want to follow. This is the house chimney, one of the key areas. Further up is the Black Pyramid, and then we reach a flatter area. Although this area is usually manageable in theory, practically I think it would be extremely difficult because of the volume of fresh snow. And then, near the peak, is the bottleneck, a 65-degree ice slope. As we experienced up there, the ice is very, very hard, so it won't be easy, particularly as our crampons will not be sharp after the long ascent over the rocks. It's not going to be easy. Amin, the Pakistani mountain guide, is also aware of it. Here to here, also difficult, I think. I mean, do you think this Mr. Hans Kammerlander is uh, possible to climb this mountain? Yes, with a strong mm. climber. Mm. <laughs> he, he's yeah. a strong climber. Yeah. You I see, mean, my friend is very good strong climber. Oh. Mm. They also climb K2, no problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know. The following morning, the weather around K2 is perfect the prayers of the Pakistani cook were heard. But before they start, unexpected visitors arrive, keen to see Hans Kammerlander. A trekking group of Germans inquire about the route he's chosen to climb K2. Their respect for the mountaineer from South Tyrol is enormous. I know, everyone wants to take your picture. Do you mind? I'm in the way. No, I want you to be on it. The mountaineer and his fans. For these men from Germany, the few minutes with their idol will be carved in their memory. Their trekking tour has been worthwhile. Hans Kammerlander, ready to leave for the peak of K2 in a couple of hours, cooperates patiently. What are you waiting for? Nothing. We're leaving in an hour. Yes, he won't be here for long. We're leaving soon. So we are keeping you, basically. Not really. We're not under pressure. <laughs> a couple of hours later, the excitement is over. The trekkers descend again. See you again at the next lecture. 
I'll let you know it's me. In the afternoon of July 14th, Konrad Auer and Hans Kammerlander start their ascent on K2 for a second time. This time, they climb the Abruzzi Ridge alone. They set out on their long way up once again. Their plan is to spend the night in Camp 1 at an altitude of 6,100 meters and then bivouac at 7,400 one last time before they go for the summit. The weather has improved tremendously. Kamerlander and Auer make good headway, regardless of the fresh snow that has covered all the tracks. They pass the house chimney without great difficulties. However, another storm hits them, and because the only way through the Abruzzi Ridge is to walk along the exposed edge, they are completely unprotected from the hurricane. They reach an altitude of 6,700 meters at 10 a.m. Time for a second breakfast and a cup of tea. Two gas containers should be enough for the next couple of days. Is the water boiling? No, not yet, but it doesn't matter. Let's put some more ice in it. It's important to drink a lot. And then, back to the battle against the knee-high snow. They are fueled by their iron determination to reach the summit. The two climbers face a hell made of snow. Although K2 has donned its most beautiful cloak, appearances are deceptive. The mountain is cruel and merciless to those trying to conquer it. This is where the pain begins, the death zone. Breathing now becomes harder. Every step is a torment. The conditions are becoming noticeably harder for Hans Kammerlander and Konrad Auer. They drudge across the deep snow. The long, icy slopes wear them down. To climb 80 altitude meters, they need more than two hours. The mood has reached an all-time low. No chance. No chance. At 7,400 meters, Kamerlander and Auer put up their bivouac. The night is stormy. On the following day, they continue their ascent to the Black Pyramid, an almost vertical precipice covered in ice. Although the track becomes flatter after the Black Pyramid, the ascent is far from easy. The avalanche risk is increased. Snow slabs can become detached at any time. The two men must go through this. There are no alternative paths. On the shoulders of K2, the hurricane has piled up the snow to form cornices. All of a sudden, the summit becomes visible. It seems so near that you could almost touch it. Seeing their target before their eyes fills the two climbers with hope and motivation, but it is already late. Hans and Conrad have managed a mere 400 altitude meters today. They decide to bivouac for another night. The temperature is already 20 below zero and the sun hasn't even set yet. Still, Hans remains optimistic. Let's start at two o'clock in the morning. We'll have to walk in the darkness for two hours, but it doesn't matter. We should manage using our torchlights. In a few hours, and with a bit of luck, we'll reach the peak. Maybe by eight in the morning. And before the storm starts again, we should be back down at the camp. Disassemble the camp and quickly descend one camp lower. The hurricane roars around the tent that night. Hans and Conrad wait sleepless for the wind to subside. At two o'clock, the storm is still fierce. Finally, three hours later, they can begin their final ascent. At five, or maybe a bit later, we left the tent. It was really cold when we walked out. And at least 40 degrees below zero, maybe even 45. Then we started walking very fast so that our bodies could warm up and cope better with the cold. We kept going up, and by about 10 o'clock, the wind subsided completely. 
But around the same time, it became apparent that reaching the peak was going to be impossible. We were only about 170 meters below the peak. No chance, not one chance. Snow wall, several meters high, presents itself as an impenetrable barrier for Hans and Conrad. This is the end of the expedition. We had passed through all the challenging places. The summit was only a stone's throw away. And then, standing before a simple snow slope, though it was a steep one, we realized we had reached our boundary. The first thing you feel as soon as you see that the summit is no longer obtainable is a deep disappointment. But, above all, exhaustion creeps in. The only thing you can do is to say goodbye to the peak. The retreat of a dejected mountaineer. Hans Kamalanda has been preparing for a year for this expedition, but the mountain of mountains was not to be conquered this year. His only comfort, he is the first man to descend K2 on skis. There is ice under there. At this altitude, downhill skiing is extremely demanding, as the skis cannot get a good grip on the icy slopes. The thought of the wasted chance to reach the peak accompanies him all the way down to base camp. Hans Kamalanda will not attempt another ascent on the peak this year. Still, the longing remains. I will only put my mind at rest when I have stood up there on the summit. I think I'll probably come back next year, and then I will know the mountain better.